But we're in the middle of our Standing on the Promises series. Why? Because we understand that the Bible clearly says Jesus tells the story of a man who built his life on the rock and a man who built his life on the sinking sand, right? And we want to build our house on the rock. And the rock is a, is a symbol, an example of God's Word. And we want to build our lives on the secure foundation of God's Word. And so we've been looking at the promises that God gives us. I challenge the elders, just share with me your favorite promise from the Bible. And that's what we've been talking about. And the first promise that we saw a couple weeks ago was that God will fight for us. You got a problem in your life? You got an enemy in your life? You got a situation? Is it financial? Is it health? related? Is it relational? Whatever. God will fight for us if we will do the things that he wants us to do. Mainly he is, we got to let him. We got to quit meddling. We got to quit trying to fix things. We got to quit trying to be God in our life with a little G. And we saw last week, the second promise we saw is that there is victory over the darkness through humility. You want to resist the devil and he flee from you? You want to resist the evil one attacking your family? Then you have to do it through humility. You're saying, Randy, I didn't get to come to those services. Well, let me encourage you. Go to our Facebook page. Go to our YouTube page. Go to our website. You will find the sermons. You can watch them. You can be reminded. You can be encouraged. Why? Because I want you. I'm looking out right now and seeing so many people whose lives are built on sinking sand. Your lives are built upon the world's opinion about what you learned in school or something silly like that. Why don't you build your life on the truth and the power of God's word so that your life can be what God intended it to be? And so today, before we get on our third promise, before we get to it, uh, why don't we start off with a simple fact? And the fact is this. During the struggles of life, it's easy to think that God has forgotten us. During the struggles of life, it is easy to think that God has forgotten us. Have you ever been there? Have you ever gone through a rough day, rough week, rough year, rough decade? I had a rough decade. I don't know about you. So have you ever been through those seasons in life where life is a struggle and it is so easy to believe and to feel that God has forgotten us. I, I wonder if Psalm 13, 1 and 2 is, is a weary mother's prayer this morning. It says, Oh Lord, how long will you forget me? Forever? How long will you look the other way? How long must I struggle with anguish in my soul? You see, like many moms, David had tried to do everything right. David had tried to follow the Lord, yet he struggled. And as his struggles got bigger, God seemed further away. Just this week, I talked with another mother who was trying to do things right. Have you ever heard a mother say, well, you know what? I've tried the discipline thing, and it just don't work for my kid. And I kept reassured her, no, no, God's word is true. You do things God's way, you will be okay. But yet the more she struggled, the more she seemed like God had forgotten all about her. The more she prayed for her kid, it seemed like God's prayer, the prayers she was praying to God were just bouncing off the ceiling. And maybe that's you today. You're saying, Randy, I'm not a mom, but I know struggle. Randy, I'm not a mom, but I know what it feels to go through the tough times in life. Randy, and I'm getting to the point where it seems like God has forgotten me. Randy, the reason why I'm here is because I've been praying all week, yet I can't hear God's voice. And I'm hoping and praying that God will speak to me through you. You're saying, Randy, what can I do when I'm in those situations? What do we do when it seems like God has forgotten us? Notice this truth. The truth is this, when we can't understand God's plan, we must trust his heart. When we can't understand God's plan, we must trust his heart. I think of Paul in 2 Corinthians 12, 8 and 9, it says, Three different times I begged the Lord to take my suffering away. Each time God said, my grace is all you need. My power is best in weakness. Now, here's the thing. I don't think you understand the frustration Paul was going through there. This is a man that God had used to write 12 to 13 books of the Bible. This is a man that had God had used to heal hundreds of people. But when it came time for God to heal him, God's like, just trust me. Don't worry about it. He had healed others, but he wouldn't heal Paul. You see, when, when Paul needed God the most, God said, hey, 
just trust me. And many moms are the same way today. They, they love God. They, they submit to their leaders. They discipline their kids, and yet they're still struggling. They're, they're doing everything they know to do, and yet life's still hard. And I don't think it's just moms here today. I think there's dads, there's husbands, there's fathers, there's sons, there's daughters, there's brothers, there's sisters. They're doing everything they knew to do, and yet they're still struggling. And so the question is this, does God give us a promise for when we struggle? Absolutely. Read with me, if you would, in Isaiah chapter 40, beginning with verse 26. Isaiah chapter 40, beginning with verse 26. He starts off reminding us of the greatness of God. And he says this in verse 26. It says, look up into the heavens. Who created all the stars? God brings them out like an army, one after another, calling each of the stars by its name. Because of his great power and incomparable strength, not a single star is missing. Verse 27 says, Oh, Jacob, how can you say the Lord does not see your troubles? Oh, Israel, how can you say God ignores your rights? Verse 28 says, Have you never heard? Have you never understood? The Lord God is an everlasting God, the creator of all the earth. God never grows weak or weary. No one can measure the depth of his understanding. God gives power to the weak and strength to the powerless. Even youth will become weak and tired, and young men will fall in exhaustion. But those who trust in the Lord will find new strength. They will soar high on wings like eagles. They will run and not grow weary. They will walk and not grow faint. Whew, that'll preach right there, won't it? Why don't we just say amen and go home? You, you don't need any help, do you? I was 16 years old, and I still remember to this day, my mama got me a, a one of those leather bookmarks to put in my Bible with verse 31 on it, and it's still has been burned in my brain today. You're saying, well, Randy, what's the promise? I'm still missing the promise. What's the promise that God gives us when we struggle? Look at your sheet. The promise is this. When I am weak, God is strong. When I am weak, God is strong. Isaiah 40, 29 says, God gives power to the weak and strength to the powerless. What's he saying there? He's saying, hey, say today, you're just dumb enough. Say today, you're just foolish enough. Say today, you're just enough to say, you know what, I'm going to stand on this promise that when I am weak, God is strong. I'm going to claim this promise for my life. I am going to trust God when it comes to this promise. What happens, what happens when we stand on promise number three? What happens when we stand on when I am weak, God is strong? Well, three amazing things happen. Look at your sheet. The first thing we need to understand is when we trust God in the tough times, we will be successful. When we trust God in the tough times, we will be successful. Go back to Isaiah 40, 31. It says, those who trust trust in the Lord, will soar high on wings like eagles. What's he saying there? That's just a symbol, that soaring high on wings like eagles. That's just a symbol of success in the Bible. And he's saying, you know what? We ain't got to scratch with the turkeys. We can soar high like wing, on the wings of eagles. You're saying, Randy, uh, you're saying I'm supposed to be successful? Yeah. Well, how come I'm not successful? Randy, I, I want to be successful. I try to be successful, but Randy, I keep failing. Why do I keep failing? Why am I not successful? Notice this fact. The fact is this. Failure is so easy, everybody's doing it. Failure is so easy, everybody's doing it. Notice what Romans 3.23 says. It says, for everyone, that means you. For everyone has sinned. We all, that means you, fall short of God's glorious standard. What's he saying there? He's saying that God's saying that we're all born losers. Write that down on your sheet. We are all born losers. That failure is in our DNA. You see, you don't have to wake up tomorrow and say, hey, I'm going to try to fail. Nope. You just do you, and you will do it automatically. Failure is in our DNA. We are all born losers. We don't have to try to fail. Just keep doing what we're doing. You see, failure is the easiest thing in the world to do. Why? Because we were all born to fail. You're saying, Randy, well, I don't want to be that way. I don't want to be a failure. I want to succeed. How do I break the cycle of failure? How do I break the cycle of failure in my life? Well, notice this truth. The truth is this, trusting God in tough times will lead to our success. Trusting God in tough times will lead to our success. You see, when most people go through tough times, 
They use that as an excuse to abandon God. Most people, when they go through tough times, they use it as an excuse to say, oh, I'm having a bad day, let's go get drunk. Oh, I'm having a bad day, let's go have sex with somebody that's not my spouse. Oh, I'm having a bad day, why don't I just take this money and blow it instead of using it the way God wants me to. Oh, I've had a bad day, I'm struggling, and so therefore I have an excuse to sin. That's what most people do. But say, just say. You decide that rather than using your struggles as an excuse to sin, you use your struggles as an excuse to trust God more. What happens? Well, God promises us in Proverbs 28, 25. He says, whoever trusts in the Lord will prosper. You ready to stop failing? Why don't you start trusting? You're saying, Randy, why is trust so powerful? Why is trust so powerful? Why? Because trust requires humility. And Proverbs 3.34 says God shows favor to those who are humble. Oh, please don't miss this. Moms, don't miss this. Hey, don't miss this. You're going to go to sleep? Don't go to sleep now. Look at you see. Our humble trust activates the favor of God, which leads to our success. Our humble faith activates the power of God, which leads to our prosperity. You're getting it, right? If you'll just humble yourself and say, you know what? I'm not going to do things my way because my way stinks. My way fails. I'm not going to do things my mama's way. My mama's way stinks. My mama's way fails. I'm going to do things God's way. I'm going to trust God. I'm going to humble myself, and I am going to do what God tells me to do. I know some of you think that because I'm a preacher, everything's just wonderful. My wife loves me. My kids love me. I walk through town, everybody's just throwing roses at me. I don't have to walk on pavement. They just put flowers out for me wherever I go. I still remember I was at a church. And all I'd done, by the way, is double the size of this church. All I'd done, by the way, is triple the size of their budget. All I'd done, by the way, is taken a 150-year-old church, and they had over 45 to 50 kids every Sunday in their children's department. That's all I'd done. And, yeah, I counted I counted, I had 95 people that wanted me fired. I don't know why I didn't have 100. I was going for 100. (laughs) But I had 95. I I had them on a piece of paper, 95 people. And the sad part was, one of them was my wife. Wanted me fired. Wanted me out of ministry. Wanted me walking, nothing against greeters at Walmart, but wanted me as a greeter at Walmart. 95 Now, I know what most preachers did, because I've seen it happen too many times. They tucked tail and they ran. I know what most preachers did. They whined and they cried, and they went and started working for a funeral home. But you know what I did? I grabbed a hold of Psalm 37. Have you ever read Psalm 37? It talks about people's enemies. David had enemies. And I had enemies. Somebody want to take food in my kid's mouth? That's my enemy. Somebody want to get me fired? That's my enemy. Somebody wants to destroy the calling that God's placed upon my life? That's my enemy. And every day, rather than tuck tail and run, and every day, rather than uh, uh, quitting and giving up, I would walk the sanctuary very much like this every day, just praying my way through Psalm 37, declaring my hope and my faith in God alone. Guess what? I'm still standing. So let me ask you a question. My question is this. Will you stop being a lovable loser? I mean, some of you, you glory in your loserness. You you glory in your failure. You glory in the fact that you ain't got no friends. You glory in the fact that you ain't got no money. You glory in the fact that your career is dead. You glory in being a loser. Will you stop being a lovable loser? Will you trust God so that you can be successful? Because if we trust God in the tough times, the Bible teaches we will be successful. But notice number two, if we trust God in the tough times, we will be supernatural. We will be supernatural. Go back to Isaiah 40, 31. He says, those who trust in the Lord will run and not grow weary. Turn your sheet over. Have you ever tried running before? I'd pay money to see some of you try. (laughs) For you to run and not grow weary and not want to die? And not collapse your lung laying on the ground? That would require a miracle, wouldn't it? That would take a supernatural occurrence of God's power. And that's what God is saying. God is saying, you know what? 
If you'll trust in me in the tough times, I will be supernatural. I will be miraculous. I will do incredible and mighty things. But you know what I've noticed? We seem to have lost that in the church today. When's the last time you saw somebody, you knew somebody, you lived life with somebody that was truly supernatural? When was the last time that you saw somebody that was amazing? When was the last time you saw a miracle-working person in your life? It's been a long time, hasn't it? Why? Because of this fact. The fact is this. God does not save us to be average. God did not save you. His son did not die on the cross so that you could be average, so that you could get a C at school, so that you could get a C at work. God did not save us to be average. Notice what 2 Corinthians 9, 8 said. It said, God is able. I don't like that phrase. God is able to make every grace overflow to you so that in every way, always having everything you need, you may excel. Underline that word, excel, in every good work. Notice he didn't say, oh, Debbie gets to be average as a mom, be average as a child of God, be average as a worker, be average. No, he says you can excel in every good work. Why? Because 1 Peter 2, 9 says Christians are a chosen people. You are a royal priest, a holy nation, God's very own possession. Because of that, as a result, you can show others the goodness of God. He's saying he didn't save you. To get by. He didn't save you to survive. He saved you to excel at showing God's miraculous goodness in every circumstance, in every situation. Can you do me a favor? Can we stop letting okay be okay? Can we stop letting average be the, old get, the goal? You see, it is not okay for Christians to be average. It is not okay for your employer to say, ah, you do okay. It's not okay for your, your boss to say, ah, they're an average employee. It is not okay for you to get C's in schools. It is not okay for you to get C's in life. God did not make you to be average. You're saying, Randy, what do I do about that? I don't, how do I do that? Hey, my mama told me that C was good. Your mama lied. What do I do? Notice this truth. The truth is this. Trusting God will transform our setbacks to set ups for amazing miracles. Trusting God will transform our setbacks to set up for amazing miracles. You see, when most people go through tough times, what do they do? They, they quit. Most people, when they go, t- go through tough times, they get into, what, what do I hear? I'm in survival mode. What? God didn't save you to survive. He saved you to thrive. So say, just say, you decide when tough times come to to dig in. Say, just say, when tough times come, you decide to work harder. Say, just say, when tough times come, you decide that, you know what, I'm not going to quit. I'm not going to give in. I'm not going to go into survival mode. Ephesians 3.20 says this, God, who is able through his mighty power at work within us to accomplish infinitely more than we might ask or think. What's Paul saying? He's saying, stop dreaming small dreams. Stop planning on being low and and having low expectations. You see, God is able. He's powerful. Why don't you pray to that God? Why don't you put your faith in that God? Why don't you trust that God? In fact, can I tell you something, moms? Listen to me, every mom. I know you came here for somebody to pat you on the back. Hey, mom, I know you came here today for somebody to tell you how awesome you are. How about this? Hey, mom, your God is too small. Your children were not created to be average. Your children were created to be miraculous. People should look at God's children, our children, and say, wow, what happened to them? My kid doesn't act like that. Why don't that happen? Because our God's so small. He can't make our kid act right. He can't keep our kids from having sex before marriage. He can't keep our kids from disobeying. He can't help our kids obey on the first time. Nope, our God's so small, he's pathetic. And so guess what? Since God is pathetic, I am pathetic too. So let me ask you a question. Will you stop accepting average? Will you stop? Will you trust God to be amazing through you? Why? If we trust God during the tough times, we will be successful. If we trust God during the tough times, we will be supernatural. But notice number three, and this is where so many of us miss it. If we trust God in the tough times, we will be sustainable. We will be sustainable. 
Go back to Isaiah 40, 31. It says, those who trust in the Lord will walk and not faint. Wow, that's endurance. Wow, right beside that, that's perseverance. Wow, that's keeping on, keeping on. By the way, we're coming up on 10 years. Can you believe it? We're coming up on 10 years here at Freedom Family Church. December 2008, we started. Now, here's what you might not know. Did you know in December 2008, five other churches started at the same time as us? In fact, they got all the good buildings. I kept going from place to place trying to get a building for us to meet in. And they, nope, this church got it. Nope, this church got it. Nope, this church got it. Five churches started at the same time we did. And guess what? None of them are still here. What happened? They, they lacked endurance. They lacked perseverance. You're saying, Randy, Why? I don't think it's just churches that disappear. Why? How come, Randy, you've had over 2,000 people walk through these doors in the last 10 years, and yet 300, maybe 350 still come? Randy, what happens? Why do people keep disappearing? Why do people keep giving up? Look at your sheet. The fact of the matter is this. Our defensiveness keeps us from keeping on with God. Our defensiveness keeps us from keeping on with God. Let's go back to those churches. God would tell those churches they need to do something different. And the pastor and the leaders say, no, I'm not going to do that. God would come to people and say, hey, you need to change. You need to do better. And they were, their defensiveness would say, nope, I'm not going to change that. I'm not going to do that. And by the way, it's not just pastors and deacons. It's not just church leaders. It's not just, it's us. Far too many of us today are Luke 8, 13. It says, there are those who hear God's teaching and accept it gladly, but they don't allow the teaching to go deep into their lives. They believe for a while, but when trouble comes, they give up. By the way, he's talking about church folk. He's talking about us. In fact, he's probably describing 60%, 70% of us today. That boy, we like good preaching. We'll laugh, we'll cry, we'll, we'll share it on Facebook. But when that preaching starts meddling, when God's word starts dealing, when our Cheerios are messed up with, it's time to go. It's time to quit. We can't do that. In fact, I, I, this is what I found. I, I've noticed this since 1989. You're saying, Randy, I was born in 1998. Well, well you're a youngin'. But this is what I've noticed since 1989. Everybody goes through a test. In fact, I call it the test. They're following God. They're loving God. I love God's preaching. I love God's word. I even, they're even reading their Bible a little bit. But then that Bible will start messing with their lives. It may be their children, which is most of our moms. It may be their wife, which is most of our husbands. It may be their job. Or, as we were reminded once again, it may be their money, and it starts meddling, and God tests them to see if they will faith Him, if they will trust Him. Oh, and don't let them start talking about food. We all have that test, and we have to decide, am I going to go God's way? Am I going to allow myself to be changed by the Spirit? Or am I going to continue to defend my sin? Am I going to continue to defend my rebellion? Am I going to continue to defend the sin and the disgusting stuff that's in my heart and life? You're saying, Randy, how do I fix this? How do I stop this? Notice this truth. The truth is this. Trusting God will give us the strength we need to keep on keeping on. Trusting God will give us the strength we need to keep on keeping on. What you're saying, what do you mean? Right now, some of you are at that test. You're taking the test today. And you're at that crossroads. Am I going to obey God or am I going to stay the same? Am I going to do what God wants me to do in regards to my wife and my children, my husband, my daughters, my sons? Or am I going to stay the same? Am I going to change or am I going to keep on down the path of destruction? You're taking the test right now. Did you know that? You didn't realize you woke up this morning and you are taking an exam. And for some of you, it may be your final one. And you've got to decide, am I going to trust God or not? Because if we trust him, he'll give us the strength to change. If we trust him, he'll, get us, he'll give us the strength to be transformed. If we trust him, that gives us the strength to keep on keeping on and not give 
up. Notice what Ephesians 3.17 says. As you trust in Jesus, your roots will grow down into God's love and it will keep you strong. You do realize what all of us have? I'm sick and tired of hearing it. Most of us are nothing but potential. Oh, Randy, they have the potential to be awesome for God. Randy, they have the potential to be a great wife or a mother. They got a potential this, a potential that. Guess what? We were all made in the image of God. We all have that potential. But you know what? God is looking at you and me today and saying, I'm sick of you just having potential. What are you going to do about it? And so maybe, just maybe today, maybe, just maybe today, you say, you know what? God, take my potential and turn it into a reality. If you do that, God promises to give you strength. To all you who are tired, God says, trust me, and I'll make you strong. To that mom that's about to give up, Hebrews 12, 3 says, think about Jesus who endured opposition from sinners so that you don't become tired and give up. Mom, I know your kids are fighting you. Where do you think they got their stubbornness? From you. I get it. They fought Jesus too. But his father, because he trusted him, gave him victory. And so my question for you is this. Are you about to give up? Are you about to walk out those doors and never come back? It happens every week. Is that you? Oh, would you turn your eyes toward Jesus? Trust him that if he wants to change your life, it's for your good. I love that phrase in the song that Jason sang. I hope you heard it over and over again. Jesus is for you. He wants to help you. Will you let him? Oh, bow your heads and close your eyes. Every head bowed and every eye closed. I don't know if you know this. Oh, please do me a favor. Don't quit on me. Don't let yourself be distracted. Everything that's been done since Sunday night of this week has led up to this moment. Please don't miss it. But did you know that Trust comes first, then power. That we have to trust God first, and then he gives us power. Oh, with every head bowed and every eye closed, I I think of the story of the Red Sea, the parting of the Red Sea. There was this sea that was a major barrier in their life, and and, and God said, cross it. And and the the, the priests were carrying the, the the Ark of the Covenant, but the water didn't start parting until they stuck their foot in the in the river, in the sea. Their faith came first, their trust came first, then came power. And so my question for you is this. When did you step out? When have you expressed faith and trust? When was that moment that you said, you know what? I'm yours, Lord. Everything I am, everything I have, everything I'm not, I'm yours, Lord. When did that happen? When did you express faith? You're saying, Randy, this Christianity thing don't work. You want to know why it don't work? Because you haven't done faith. Faith comes first. Trust comes first. When did you put your faith in God? You're saying, Randy, my grandfather was a preacher. Doesn't matter. This is about you. There's only two people in this room that matter right now. That's you and God. When did you put faith in Jesus? You're saying, Randy, I want to. I've, I've got faith. While you were preaching, man, my, my heart's been so full of faith. I, I believe that God can change me. I believe that God can fix me. I, I believe that God's way is best, Randy. But how do I express it? How do I put my faith in Jesus? Well, in just a few seconds, I'm going to do for you what my daddy did for me. I still remember the night that God gave me faith. Faith to believe that God's word was right, that I was a sinner. Faith to believe that God could save me. Jesus could save me. But I didn't know what to do. So I ran to my daddy and my daddy dropped down on his knees and he prayed a simple prayer. And he invited me to pray it with him. And I prayed this prayer with him. And that faith 
activated the power of God and he saved me eternally, forever. I couldn't run from him even if I want to. Where can I go? He's already there. So I wonder, would you pray with me? I know I'm not your daddy. I don't want to be. But I can pray with you to God so that you can be saved. You can be forgiven. You can be given a new heart and life. You're saying, Randy, do I need to pray out loud with you? Yeah. Why? Because, man, it, it is amazing how many people walk out that door and they forget what happened. And so I want you to pray it out loud with me. Why? So there'll be other people around you that hear you. There'll be other people around you as a witness. But here's the cool thing. I'm asking everybody that is a believer to pray this prayer with me too. Why? So that you won't be by yourself. You won't be all alone. You won't feel all embarrassed. And, and I'm, I'm challenging every believer. If you, call, if you call yourself a Christian, I want you to pray not quietly, out loud to help somebody, help somebody make the most important decision of their life. So would you pray with me? Would you just pray? Dear Jesus, I'm a sinner. Please forgive me of my sin. Come into my heart. Be my Savior and Lord. And Jesus, help me to live for you. It's in your name I ask. Oh, with every head bowed and every eye closed, if you prayed that prayer with me, then guess what? Your faith has resulted in God's power. And He has transformed you. He has adopted you. He has changed you. So many awesome things have happened that you will spend from now for the ever figuring out how awesome your salvation is. You are saying, well, Randy, what's the first thing I need to do? You need to tell somebody. You can tell me. You can tell Jason. You can tell somebody that you came with. Hey, how about you tell your mom? That's an idea. But you need to tell somebody what happened to you today. Let me pray for you. Dear God, I just thank you. I thank you that you're still saving people today. I thank you, Lord God, that you're still saving losers like me today. Lord, I just ask that you be with those who prayed this prayer with me for the first time. They, they responded in faith with prayer. Lord, I ask that you give them the courage, the excitement, the joy to tell somebody, to not keep it hidden. Lord, we post so many stupid things on Facebook. Why don't we post this, Lord? Help us to honor and glorify you today. It's in your name I pray. Amen.